Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our session on women in the media. It has been a momentous week for coverage of Welsh females. The Western Mail has published its annual list of 50 sexiest Welsh women. Um, I do moan about this every year, but one of my colleagues points out if I was actually ever in it, it might not be such an affront to my principles, but there we are. Um, having once reached the dizzy heights of Wales on Sunday's uh, number 49 in Wales' top bachelorettes, I can, I can die happy on that point, I think. Um, but uh, we're here to discuss how women are represented within the media and how they are represented by the media. And I don't think we could have two better speakers to illustrate those themes. Um, Professor, Professor Karen Ross has written extensively on the relationship between women, politics and media, politicians and journalists, and on the broader issues of inequality and identity in communication and culture. Welcome, Karen. And Sean Gale is Director of Cwmni Pawb. She's a member of the Equality and Human Rights Commission's Wales Committee and Chair of the South Wales Freelance Branch of the media union BEC2. And I know that throughout her career, Sean has, has been particularly concerned with promoting women and ethnic minorities in the media. Now, Karen and Sean are both going to make a presentation on the respective themes, um, and then we'll broaden the discussion afterwards. I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions and, uh, and how these two key themes actually uh, link up. So, Sean? Um, if you'd like to make a start, please. Okay. Dear uh, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline, for that presentation. Uh, a few words in Welsh, and then, fortunately, I will be turning to English. The themes of my speech today is women in the creative media behind the scenes. English, but if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to answer in Welsh later on. Um, just to, to make it clear from the start, I'll be talking more about sort of women behind the scenes in the media, and I, and my, I myself and used to be behind the scenes, so it's quite daunting having a, a, a sort of a, a professor on one side and a journalist on the other, so please bear with me. Um, as Caroline mentioned, um, I've got sort of um, a sort of a bit of a portfolio career, and I think that's quite usual for for those of us working across the creative media industries. And uh, one of my roles, um, it's one day a month. It's um, on the Equalities and Human Rights uh, Wales Committee. Um, and basically, what we do as, as the Wales Committee is advise the, um, the the Commission in Wales on Welsh issues. And one of the key challenges that we've um, identified is to, is in terms of the power and voice. Um, of, uh, of underrepresented groups, really, including women. And we're looking at ways of increasing participation of uh, protected groups in decision making and make Wales as public, private, and third sector bodies representative of the people they serve. So that really fits into what we're discussing today. The other thing that the um, Commission does is we do quite a lot, we do a lot of um, research. And the research, sometimes on a UK basis, but we've done quite a lot of research here in Wales. And uh, a couple of years ago, the Commission did a research on who do you see? And that was sort of research from the public asking about who do they see? Who do, who do we see in Wales and how do we, how do we view people? And I think the, um, the results were sort of uh, quite surprising. And there were four groups that had come across as being particularly um, discriminated against or, or not viewed negatively, I should say. And they were refugees and asylum seekers, gypsy travellers, transgender people, and people with mental health conditions. And I'll, I'll provide a case study um, later, but um, the EHRC um, undertook some research with these groups called Not Just Another Statistics, and these are all on the website. And one of the key issues for this group, these groups, was the way that they were portrayed in the media, and the media kept on these stereotypes. So it does link into, into what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. Um, on my portfolio side, um, I work as a, a trainer. So I do a lot of training in terms of creative industries, but also for um, trades unionists and through communities through the Workers' Education Association. I'm very conscious as well of what Philippa was saying this morning about uh, warmth and professionalism. So that's uh, quite interesting in terms of presentations. OK. In terms of the sector in, uh, in the creative industries, what are we talking about? It is one of the Welsh Government's key priority sectors. So the Welsh Government has identified nine sectors that are of economic importance to Wales. And there are about 20,300 people in Wales working in this sector. The sector I'm particularly interested in this afternoon is the TV, radio and film. And we've got about 4,500 people working in Wales in TV, radio and film. 
And who are they? Who are the people that we're talking about behind the scenes? There's the decision makers, and the decision makers are people like the broadcasters, the um, commissioning editors, the influencers, and again, that's what we're talking about today. And then the next stop down is people like um, the producers, the directors, the writers, and the researchers. Then we've got the technical and camera. They decide on what we look like on screen, etc., and what you can hear. And then there's the craft, design, costume, makeup. And again, it, they're the visuals of the, um, of the medium. And then we've got the video editors. Again, very important because they cut in and out of what we say, and we know how important that could be, and I hope we do anyway. Right, okay, so we're talking about behind the scenes and we're looking at portrayal today. So why are the people behind the scene, really? Basically, the media reflects our communities, the reflection of our communities. So factual news, current affairs and documentaries. Who decides on what's shown on the screen and, and who are the programme makers? I mean, how are women portrayed? And that's a bit more of what Karen's going to be talking about later on. Um, it's interesting because... Um, Philippa again this morning mentioned about tweets. I'm fairly new to tweeting and I haven't got many followers yet, um, but I have tweeted a couple of times because there's a certain um, programme on S4C, it's on every week, but for the last three weeks the, all the panellists have been men. I mean, it's a woman and male presenter, but every single panellist has been a man, so I hope, you know, the fourth week along now we will see an actual woman on the panel, but as I've only got about 12 people following me, that it's not having that much of an impact. Um, so after Philippa's thing this morning, I think I'll look for some more people to follow or get more people like yourselves, hopefully, will be making these comments. And then there's drama. Again, there's, I mean, I've been in the industry for quite a while, and funnily enough, I'm going on about Philippa, I'm 52 as well, so it must be, a, we must have got a lot in common. But who writes those dramas, who commissions those dramas is really important. And again, I'm going to give you an example of S4C. It's been a while since I've seen a really good drama on S4C that portrays women. And on a good news is Alice, which is out now, which those of you who either watch S4C because you're well speaking or watch it with subtitles, it's a, a very strong, feisty, working class woman character. And there's a few strong women characters in there. But if we don't have women writers, or first of all, if we don't have women commissioners, they're not going to be commissioned. So it doesn't matter how many women writers you have. So these roles are really important. And then Catalane is the expert on uh, sport. But again, look at the impact of the Olympics. I'm fed up of uh, people saying, oh, no one wants to watch women's sport. Yes, they do. They want to watch women's sport and they want to watch disabled sports, etc. Sports are for all. So, you know what I mean, let's try and get rid of some of these stereotypes. And then light entertainment, again, it was really good to see that sort of um, clip earlier with a stand-up comedian. How many stand-up comedians do you see on television? Not many. They are around, and I mean, Gwen or David has written an article on uh, stand -up, women's stand-ups, <laughs> a book, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> a whole book. But they are around, but again, unfortunately, we don't see them as often as we like. OK, I've got a question for you, a bit of interaction here. In, um, in 2009, 5,750 people left the creative industry. How many of those do you think were women? Anyone like to guess? How many? 4,000? Actually, it was 5,000. OK. And... I think this was in my, in my brief, but um, for in, in Wales, 38% of people working in the industry in 2006 were women. By 2009, do you think that had increased or decreased? And what do you think the percentage is, what is well, by 2009, it might be lower now. It went down to 28%. Okay, so... They're huge figures, really. They're not, they're not very good for Wales. And the UK figure is 38, so we're doing much worse than Wales in terms of women in the, in the um, creative media sector. OK, so why is it a lack of um, gender balance? And again, I think the, some of the themes that were brought up this morning are coming up here as well. Um, informal recruitment and promotion practices. And there's plenty of stats there saying that, you know, most of the jobs in the industry are via informal means and women are much more likely to have undertaken unpaid work and I was quite interested we've just had a conversation about training and mentoring but it's not that they're not as well trained they are more trained than their male counterparts but unfortunately they're not moving on up 
there have been some um, programmes in, in, in London and recently in Manchester and from the Union back to on something called Moving On Up because people in, uh, in black and Asian minority uh, backgrounds weren't it weren't being uh, coming into the media either and they said we're fed up of people saying do more training more training more training it's not training we're just not getting the jobs and it has worked they've had done some speed networking events with the um with producers and commissioning editors etc and and that started to change a little at least in in london etc but also there's the poor work in practices the extremely long working hours and the culture of a lot of the media organizations the way that they employ people and this is in terms of in wales but also in terms of the rest of the uk the significant amount of freelance working and fixed term contracts and that's going to get worse because there's 36% cuts now facing S4C and there's 20% cuts facing the BBC and they are the main uh, people providing work uh, for the sectors. And there's very few opportunities for flexible working. We were talking to the BBC a couple of years ago about um, freelancing and, and thinking of different working practices and the response was, oh, freelancers and working practices never thought of that, never occurred to them. And again, we're still trying to bang on, on that door. And this is a bit of a, a horrible quote, really. And um, you know, why aren't people? Why are so many people leaving, especially in their 30s and 40s? You know, people are leaving rapidly in those sort of groups. They're coming in, but they're not staying. And this is why this person went back to work after 24 hours, which is ridiculous. Um, I started to start when I was working in television. I went back after three weeks. I didn't go back full time. I just had to start going to meetings, etc., to get more work because I couldn't afford to stay um, without uh, any pay for too long. Okay, so we've talked about the negatives and and uh, and and you know the poor situation, but um, you know it's not all gloom and doom. What can we do, and what can you know everyone do in this room, and what can the Welsh government and the Welsh Assembly uh, do? Really, the National Assembly. We need to ensure that equality is considered in all policy and strategy doc documents. In Wales, we've got the Government of Wales Act 2006, very strong on equality. It's one of the first governments to say it's got to be cross-cutting in everything we do. Well, excuse me, why have we got the Hargreaves Creative Industries Review that doesn't even mention equalities? That's, a, 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 that's what sort of the, the uh, current strategy is based on. So, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, the, um, our government implements its policies. And then we need to ensure that social partners, trades union, third sector organisation as well, as consulted in, in, in the creative industries uh, way forward, as well as the uh, sort of employers. And then we need to encourage that women apply for app appointments such as the creative industry sector panels. It's not for everybody, it's for people who work in the sector, but again, it's about women as leaders and we need to have more women leaders within the sector. And currently there's a vacancy for the Audience Council for Wales, and that's the BBC's Audience Council for Wales that advise on BBC Wales's productions. The closing date is the 3rd of the 12th, unfortunately it's unpaid, but if anyone's interested in going on the Council for Wales, it's, it's worthwhile um, doing. And then the S4C authority, that's a paid position. Last year, eight out of people on the authority, eight out of nine of the people on authority were men. The situation this year is, is a little bit better. But we, again, we need to make sure that people are applying for these sort of posts. And then we need to keep up to date with um, gender balance of decision makers. So we've got a publication, Who Runs Wales in Your Pack, that's from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, but on the website it's a bit more updated, so again, you know, make sure that we, we keep up to date as who's making decisions. And again, it's following the theme that Philippa mentioned this morning, Twitter and social media can bring, enable us to be a bit more empowered, so, you know, put those, get those pens out, if you don't like what you're seeing on the screen, if you don't see women in sport, you don't see women on your light entertainment program, if you don't see them on the panel, then write and let them know, and tweet. <laughs> okay, and then contact the media regarding potential stories. So there are organizations here. So if you want your story, whether gender related or whatever, then 
contact the journalist with a story and, and a picture and encourage other women to do so. The BBC has got a database of contributors. Again, write to the newsroom and tell them. Put yourself up if you, if you can speak well about a specific theme, because the idea is there's not enough women out there who can talk about this. But sometimes, especially that you know, journalists are being cut now, there's less and less time for them to do research. But you know, give them the information and make sure you're on their databases. Um, I think I've gone on too long, so I won't give the not just another. Well, in terms of the HRC, one of the things that we have done is met with media professionals, that's journalists, but also programme makers, and introduced them to third sector organisations. So in terms of transgender um, and um, gypsy travellers, it did result in ITV doing two programmes on those issues. So it can work, a bit of lobbying, a bit of giving giving the journalists or the programme makers the right information or giving them ideas about a story, then that can work. And then finally, I mean, it surprises me that we've got this figure, 38% to 28% of women leave in the industry. There should be an outcry. It's just in a little document somewhere. It's a huge, huge problem. So again, I think that's for those of us who are in the sector, but also you as viewers, etc., to say, well, hang on, this is not reflecting our communities and us as women. Then we need to do something about it. And then finally, um, is there a Welsh alternative to this massive drop? The, a lot of research also telling us at the moment that with the recession and with the way that the media sort of recruits, there's a, there's a socioeconomic angle to this all as well, where poorer people are going to have less access to um, media jobs. So we're going to have the elite, we're going to have the, the, the um, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, Eton brigade running our media always has been a bit thus in terms of the top of the BBC and places like that, but we thought we were starting to move in the right direction, but I'm afraid we're going back downhill. Okay, well, Diochan Bauer, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sean. That was really interesting. I, just a few points I'd like to pick up on and maybe just add some anecdotes, really, of my, um, my own experience in uh, the production industry. Um, I work for um, an independent television and radio company, um, and a lot of women in my circle are similar age, kind of late 30s to late 40s. Um, and what I've noticed in the last uh, year, six months or so, is how many of us have been made redundant, myself included, actually. I've been in the process of starting up a new company at the moment. Um, friends who work for S4C and BBC, and I think women, had, um, generally in Britain, it's been said that we're taking the brunt of the, of the economic difficulties, and I know that is certainly the case in, in the Welsh creative industries at the moment. Um, and just anecdotally, you, you talk about the people who make the decisions, and, and those are the people who shape the kind of television we watch and radio we hear. Um, um, Sean and I were having a chat before we began on, on how you have to pander to the character of the commissioning editor um, and make programmes that they'd like to watch, really, rather than ones you'd like to watch. Um, I've been battling to get food on, uh, on, on Welsh television. I know it's, it's, it's catered very well on, on S4C, uh, but I make... Um, a programme on the radio, which is one they've told us is one of the most successful series they've had, um, called Whales on the Menu. Um, like Gwen and I'm having a little plug. But um, it's not really a programme about food, it's about characters, it's about um, the, what chefs are like, the, the professional cooking world, people who love home cooking. It, it's, it's a narrative. And yet every time I go in and pitch this to television, there's a man there who obviously does no cooking himself and just think, oh, it's just women's stuff, it's not uh, general interest. Um, and also, um, I think this is particularly a Welsh problem. I've been asked four or five times in the last five years um, from someone, a producer sitting in an edit, who's got to the end of a documentary series and thought, oh, shit, we've got no women in this. <laughs> and and it's, this has happened um, in a series, everything from Welsh politics to a documentary on Merlin. And I've had to step in with a sound bite, so there's a female face somewhere in the, in the mix. So uh, as you say, you... you mapped out the hierarchy of programme making. And unless we have enough influence at every stage from decision making down to craft, then uh, we're not going to get the gender balance that we need. And, you, and as we saw from that brilliant YouTube clip, um, how frustrated young women in particular are at uh, misrepresentation. I think about a programme like The Valleys at the moment. My 14-year-old niece is very upset about. She lives in the Ronda. It's distraught that people um, in Cardiff, let alone the rest of Britain, think that that's how young women conduct themselves. And, um, and sadly, that's got a female producer, so maybe it's, uh, it's not all uh, 
men's fault. But um, but some very good points there, Sean, and, and thank you for that. We'll 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 have some questions from the floor later on those points. But I'd like to move on to Karen's uh, presentation now, because I know uh, time is of the essence, and then perhaps we can draw everything together at the end. Karen. So I'm going to kind of just talk very briefly on um, on work that I've been doing over the last kind of 15 years, looking at this relationship between women, politics, and media. And this is me, uh, circa 1993. Um, and I, got, I started getting interested in this relationship between women, politics, and media when I stood as a counsellor, um, as you can see, nearly 20 years ago. And what amazed me, as someone who had no kind of experience of the media up until that point, was how I was constantly framed as the either feminist academic um, who really shouldn't be standing because what did I know about politics? I'd only been a member of the Labour Party for a very few number of years. Um, or the, the kind of the young, uh, dikey, jackbooted uh, contender um, because obviously I kind of was a young woman, liked to wear DMs, um, and again, shouldn't actually be standing because what did I know about politics? And I was standing against a male contender, um, a, a man in his 50s who was a church warden, and we were constantly kind of juxtaposed in the local media. Um, nothing to do with our policies, nothing to do with whatever we believed in, but absolutely to do with what the media thought we were, who, who the media thought we were as individuals. And it occurred to me that to, to consider whether my experiences were replicated um, around the country, and in fact, later on, around the world, whether my experiences as a young woman politician, the way in which the media were framing me, was similar in, in other places. So I started this, this journey of, of looking at that kind of relationship. So over the, the, the last you know, 18 years, I've been looking at this relationship both in, in two ways, both looking at media discourse and how the media, news media, often print media, frames women parliamentarians and how women themselves as parliamentarians, how they develop their media relationships and their own views on the way in which the media frame them, not just them as individual women parliamentarians, but them as a, as a group. So. This, that, that first kind of comment, Bambi Thumper and the one in the dress, was really about the Labour leadership election in 1994. Um, and to me, it kind of exemplified the way in which the media kind of just liked to kind of trade in stereotypes, liked to try and compartmentalise you. So you had Tony Blair, you had John Prescott, and you had Margaret Beckett. Um, and Margaret Beckett, interestingly, at that time, was actually deputy leader. When John Smith died, she became kind of proxy leader, but she was never, ever, 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 ever in the frame as being the party leader. She, it was never even a consideration. And there was some really quite, you know, horrible, nasty, uh, vile media about her, compared with certainly, John Prescott didn't have much of a good press either. Tony Blair, obviously, as Bambi, um, had very good press. So I started kind of looking at, at these, at the kind of tropes, the kinds of discourse, the kinds of language, the kinds of photos which accompanied um, media uh, representation of, of, of parliamentarians. So I've been looking o over the, this last kind of the, these last few years at, at both kind of press um, discourse, mo mostly around ele at election time, because that's really when most politicians get the most press, and it's certainly the time when most women parliamentarians actually ever get in front of, um, in front of a camera. And because I, I was really interested in actually talking to women, because if, if you're looking, it's, it's fine, I mean, it's, it's why it's interesting that we have people, you know, at, at the conference from both sides of the camera, people who are actually producing news and people who are represented by news because my work is really only focused on, on content, and I think it's really useful and uh, important to understand the kind of production process. But from women parliamentarians' point of view, they have a number of things to say about the way in which they develop their media relationships. And what I kind of 
what I began to realise when I started kind of talking with, with women politicians at Westminster, the first person I ever interviewed was Anne Widdicombe. And I remember going to see her. She was when she was Home Secretary, and it was like the week after she had made the rather infamous pronouncement that a woman who was about to give birth, who was actually an offender, needed to be chained to her bed with handcuffs just in case she escaped as she was giving birth. And Anne Widdicombe, when I felt when I arrived as a relatively novice researcher, actually happened to have some young guy doing work experience. And as I was ushered into the very inner, inner sanctum of where she was sitting, she was sitting at the end of a really, really long table. And so I went in, she was sitting at the end of the table, young guy sitting next to her. And she said, have you got a tape recorder? I obviously said yes. She said, well, just, just throw it down the table, which I literally did, kind of slid it down the table. And she spoke for half an hour into the tape recorder. Never, ever had eye contact. One of the things I found kind of really interesting about Anne Widdicombe at that point is that she dyed her hair very obviously, but she had really perfectly manicured, beautiful nails. And yet she kind of denied her femininity. She denied at every, at every opportunity that her, that her sex had anything to do with her politics. And, and she, she'd said on tape that she would be amazed, scandalised, distressed if her male colleagues actually <coughs> thought about her, thought of her as a woman. Um, I'd like, you know, I, I thought about that quote. I did actually use that quote uh, subsequently. Um, but so, so what I've been doing over these past years is trying to kind of find, are there common themes? If we kind of look at Westminster or New Zealand or Australia or South Africa, are there common themes that women experience in terms of kind of media discourse? So I've gathered together some of those common themes. And one, of, one of the kind of issues I've had over, over the, the last kind of 20 odd years of doing this work, if people want to be quite awkward with the kinds of things that I say, they will often say, oh, well, it's fine you to talk about women, but how do you know that those experiences aren't also replicated uh, within, uh, with men's experiences? What's the point of only ever looking at women's experiences because surely you need to know how they fit, how they fit within the, the, the larger dynamic of, of the political world. And, of course, one of the things I say is most of the research which is done on politicians, and certainly most of the research which looks at politicians and the media, necessarily is about men. Because it's only very recently that we can even talk about the body of women politicians, because it's only recently we've actually had enough women for us to even think about researching them as a separate group. So most work out there, most academic work that looks at, at, at politics and media is necessarily about men. So, so I sort of see my work as a kind of corrective of a way of actually enabling women's voices through me to, to be articulated. So this first point about tabloidization men would say that as well. All politicians would, would, would say that this is, this is a real problem, that in fact the dumbing down means that you know, necessarily it's going to be style over substance. And that's, that's entirely true, I, I, I think, that that's, that would be my observation. But what women parliamentarians say is that because they fight so hard for any kind of media visibility, that actually everything they do is overly represented, is overly determined by by their sex. So you think about someone like Margaret Thatcher, for, 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 for good or ill, on the one hand, she was groundbreaking in becoming the first British uh, Prime Minister. On the other hand, when she became um, the ex-Prime Minister, kind of the, the news was full of never, never Margaret, never again, as if somehow her legacy was actually to just put the you know, put the kibosh on the, the possibility of a woman ever being prime minister ever again because of, of her behaviour. And you can't imagine anyone ever saying that about men, that men don't have to represent their whole sex. They can just be individuals. So what women say is that there are different rules for, for, for them, that in fact the media construct them as, as it were, straw women. They construct them to say that, you know, you have... We expect you to have higher morals, to, to be more ethical. And of course, when, when they then are not those things, when they do get caught 
with their expenses scandals or sp speeding or with their hands in the till or doing anything else. Somehow the opprobrium that the media kind of meets out to them is much more significant and much, much more hostile than, than we would ever see in terms of kind of male politicians. As if to say, well, men, <laughs> yeah. Of course, we expect that from male, from, from male politicians. We don't expect that from women. So I think there is a sense in which they are kind of set up to fail from, from the very beginning. So they, they have different rules. They're put on a pedestal. There's also, if, 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 if anyone does any kind of serious work of, of looking at media discourse and looking at the language that's used to describe women parliamentarians, it, you have words like, you know, catty or strident or shrill to, to describe their voices. In elections, when you have women standing, if you only have women standing in a constituency, it's often seen as a cat fight or a girl fight or they get their claws out. You often have photos where... If you have men photographed, they're often photographed in Westminster context on College Green, full length, looking very sober in a suit. Women, on the other hand, are often photographed in their offices with a block vase of flowers behind them, photos of their family on the desk. So, and even though, you, at one hand, on one level, you can say, well, does that really matter? Surely that just shows the human side, their family side. Yes, of course it does do that, but it also, they would, well, I would argue, they wouldn't necessarily argue that, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it actually can undermine their potency as kind of political actors if actually they're always seen in a, in a domesticated space. <coughs> even, if, even their office is a domesticated space if it, doesn't, if it doesn't look like an office, if it just basically looks like their living room. The idea of kind of marginalising women's voices, I think that... I mean, it's, it's a kind of weird thing to be researching an absence. So when I'm looking, when I'm doing my work and looking for, for example, looking at the 2010 elections and where women candidates featured in kind of media discourse, what you're actually looking at is you're looking at an absence. So you're counting an absence, which, which is a bit weird. What that means then is that when you actually do look at where women are represented, you're, look, you're, you're looking at something which is as I said, so totally over-determined because everything, because that small space that women actually are given has to stand for all women <coughs> candidates standing in, in any particular election. So there's this, this idea of both marginalising women's voices and then undermining the voices when they do actually get any, any kind of media play. When I was in South Africa, which was probably was, was 10 years ago, what women there said, particular particularly um, kind of black women, would talk about this kind of double whammy of being both black and women. So the idea of, of political journalists, certainly in a South African context, probably, it, it's probably slightly different now, but I'm, I'd be surprised if it's very, very different, is that there is even more, of a, more antipathy towards kind of black women as, as politicians than, than women, than, than Anglo women, because they can't, you know, most political journalists, certainly in South Africa at that time, were kind of white Afrikaans men. And the idea of actually a woman, black woman, being in any position of power was, was really very, very hard to take. There's also the kind of issue around their domestic arrangements, and we see that with people like Jackie Smith. So Jackie Smith came to the public eye in the expenses scandal, not because of anything she did, but because of what, what her husband was, was up to. So that somehow women's, women parliamentarians' domestic life, their husbands, they become infamous through their husbands in a way that is not really the case with, with men. Often men actually, men's wives often are seen as kind of political uh, attributes or actually positive aspects. I mean, people like Sherry Blair. Um, and... Hillary Clinton was probably an, a, a really big asset to Bill. I'm not sure that now we would sort of see quite the, quite the, the same in the opposite direction. Well, we wouldn't, would we? Um, so, you know, there are ways in which, you know, the political spouse, in some cases, is an asset, in some cases, uh, is a hindrance. Um, and then lastly, the Bridget Jones effect. I think that I had more comments, and it's something which continues to be incredibly problematic, which is the continual sexualization and commodification of women's bodies. So, so Sean kind of showed us that clip from misrepresentation, which was very much about 
the body, the sexualisation of the kind of female body. And women parliamentarians would say it's the same for us. You know, we, we are not, we are women first and we're politicians, maybe second. Well, actually, probably we're women first and we're often wives and mothers second and then possibly we're, we're, we're politicians. So there, there's a really, for, for, for most women parliamentarians, they will talk about this the media's interest in their sartorial style, their shape, their hair, their shoes, and, and everything else. So one of the things that kind of women do talk about, and one of the things that, if, uh, again, kind of doing any kind of discourse analysis you would see, is the way in which women politicians are named, the kinds of naming strategies. So often with women, you'll get, the media will often use their first names as a way of, uh, I would argue, of undermining them. Um, in a way which is very rarely done with, with, with men. And again, here is, is the, it, this is a bit of the, the, the kind of the catfight idea. This, this is Julia Gillard, and Julia Gillard is, has been very recently in the, in the media's eye, um, because Julia Gillard currently, not then, is now Prime Minister of Australia, stood up in the House about four weeks ago and really let rip at the opposition leader, Tony Abbott, um, for his uh, misogynistic tendencies. <laughs> but here, this clip, the, this, this image, this idea that somehow could be de that a woman could be deliberately barren, uh, I mean, I, do, I just find it quite astonishing that that actually could be, this is an epithet, that, that actually for, for her, um, this was something deliberate and, and awful. And in the same way that Angela Merkel, when she was actually um, campaigning to be Chancellor in Germany, she was one of the kind of key strategies of her opposition was that she couldn't actually be Chancellor. She couldn't represent Mother Germany because she wasn't a mother. Um, and that was, a kind of, that was a kind of serious political ploy on the, on, on the part of, her, of the opposition. What women say is that whatever they try and do it is, is never going to be right. So they either kind of dress like a man or they dress like a bimbo. I mean, it, it's, it's one, or the, one or the other, generally speaking. So here's Theresa May. Um, actually, I haven't got time. I won't go, go through this. Theresa May and I actually almost share a birthday. She doesn't look good in that picture. And the point about saying she doesn't look good in that picture is that... Out of all the possible pictures there are of Theresa May, this is the picture that actually that that was chosen for that particular um, article. So on the one hand, me media do actually are incredibly influential in terms of how how they choose to frame uh, women parliamentarians. What women parliamentarians themselves say is, okay, well there are things that we can do, the things that I can do to actually try and wrest some control over the kind of trivialising tendencies of the media. And these are some of the things that they say, which is really about giving the media, I mean, I think it's a point that, that Sean made, particularly at this point, where the, the media is constantly, you know, leak, leaking um, resources, the more that kind of women parliamentarians can give media things so that they can't actually be misquoted. If you actually take control of your own press release, if you actually give give the media things, then it's much more difficult to, to be misquoted. Also, the idea, because, because, so, because for women parliamentarians, because it is really difficult for them to get visibility, when a journalist does ring them, the, it's, it's so seductive to, to, to just say something there and then, rather than just taking a breath or saying, I, I, can I phone you back? I mean, I, I do this. I mean, I'm, I'm on my, in my universities, I'm in, in the um, you know, experts directory to kind of talk, mouth off about various things. And sometimes I do mouth off, and I don't do that anymore because I have been misquoted, or not necessarily misquoted, but quotes taken out of context. So you end up t you know, sounding like a complete idiot. Um, which, is, which isn't a good look, particularly if your students happen to be listening and then they kind of throw it back in your face the next week. So, so actually just taking a breath and making sure that, again, you're in control of, of your own kind of media profile. Cultivating local rather than kind of um, national uh, contacts. I'm just being given the kind of just, yeah, wash up here. Broken record. Again, if we know, if we believe that actually... Eight seconds is the typical soundbite. 
great thing about Twitter, only 140 characters, it forces you to say something really tight in a very short space of time. So broken record, just keep saying the same thing over and over again. It can actually be very boring for the listener, but it does avoid you being misquoted. Um, taking care about media opportunities, because one of the things that women do like to do is they like to do kind of just informal media and doing you know, things like, um, I know that's Caroline, for sartorial, uh, sartorial style. So here's a photo shoot uh, during the election of 2010. Um, three sets of photos, there, three photos there, one of the Tories, one of the Lib Dems, one of the um, Labour, Labour Party. You know, let's, let's, we, could, we could play a bit of a game, who's who. I think the, the bottom one is a bit of a giveaway uh, with the yellow. But if we, interestingly, I think for the Tories, you know, let's, let's have, let's dress down. Let's all look a bit chavvy, unlike the Labour, la Labour women. And the point about saying that is that these women have actually chosen to kind of, to dress in a particular way or have been encouraged to dress in a, in a, in a particular way. Um, and what I would kind of argue is that there will always be the satirists, and you can find all sorts of horrible kind of mock-ups um, on, on the internet. But then, you know, women also need to kind of think, okay, if the media are going to trivialise me, well, don't, don't, I'm not going to give them the ammunition. I'm not going to wear a short-skirted suit, sit on the front row, and allow the, photogra the photographer to sit on the floor and shoot me upwards. You know, it's a bunny boiler moment. It's just, it's, it's not sensible. Um, you know, we, we know if, if the media are going to be looking at your sartorial style, don't give them the ammunition of showing off your cleavage in, unless, you, you know, unless you're actually cultivating that kind of media. I mean, Jackie Smith here, I mean, she, you know, busty Jackie Smith. Oh. I won't go, what we get. So just to, to wash up. One of the things that uh, it seems to me that we can, we, can, we can do for ourselves is to take control of what we, what we can do. We can take control through our major media relationships. We can take control through using things like social media. Um, and we can take control of our wardrobe. So, you know, I think that you know, we, we'd ended with kind of social media and, and we'll probably kind of talk again about social media. But it just seems to me that there are things that we can do to kind of control our image in, in a way which actually puts us back into the driving seat so we're not constantly victim to the kind of media's procl procl proclivities to trivialise us. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Just before I open uh, for questions from the floor, Karen, and, um, in the context of what you've just been talking about, what do you think of the um, media control tactics of Nadine Dorries? <laughs> we see what, what I thought was what was fascinating about Nadine Dorries is that what her her justification was that she would be able to reach a wider audience um, through going on uh, Army Celebrity. Because the very the very fact that she actually said that meant that every every potential political point that she wanted to make has been edited out. Be, be, you know, so, so I think that just was a massive backfiring. And plus the fact it was post hoc rationalisation. She just wanted a four-week jolly in Australia. <laughs> and it, it's, it, yeah, it, it, it would be, I think that this was her exit strategy. I, ca I can't imagine she's going to come back as a... Actually, I did tweet on that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions, ladies? There's a gentleman with a roving mic, is there? Or, or you've all got microphones yourself, I presume, have you? Yeah. Lady over there. Um, I'd just like to introduce myself. Uh, Lisa Marie Brown from Pinkspiration. I'm working on a new educational reality TV program called Design Factor, which is a mix between X Factor and DIY SOS. Um, I'd like to celebrate the fact um, that we're all women in business, politics, and in the media. And um, just one of the issues um, that I would like to sit, talk about is um, how the media choose to pay certain celebrities extortionate amounts of money and um, what your views are on redistrib uh, redistributing that wealth to pay women in the media. Sean, I think this one's for you. <laughs> Ooh, I, I think it worries me more when it's public money. I think it really worries me when sort of um, BBC, you know, BBC would pay huge amounts of money for 
for um, celebrities, but you, we know why they do it. They do it because of ratings, um, because they want to get as many ratings as possible. So that's why they, uh, they pay celebrities such a high amount of money. Um, although I'm sure that uh, if we looked at the, um, if we looked at uh, comparing the pay, that the pay of uh, women celebrities is going to be um, less than male celebrities. Um, so personally, I, I'd like to see a cap on how much people are paid really by the private or the, or the, or the public sector. I'd like to sort of redistribution of wealth. That would be fantastic. Can't afford to pay anybody in Wales anyway, <laughs> apart from Derek Brockway or somebody. But there we are. Um, next question. <laughs> Ellen Wynn, Adoy, and Arv I'm Ellen Wynn, and I used to work for the BBC. I used to work for the BBC as a producer and an editor in the political department, and I've left for six years now. I just wanted to make two points and comments. Carolyn spoke, said earlier that you know, a lot of her peers in the, have lost their jobs recently. Not only are a lot of women leaving the creative industries in Wales, but a lot of women over 40 doing so as well. So there are very few older women who continue to work in the media. There are not all that many men either, but there are more men over 50 years old working in the media than women. And I don't know many women over 50 years old who still work in the media in Wales, to tell you the truth. And the second point I wanted to make was, relates to the, journal, the political journal, journalistic culture and c journalism in Wales in particular, there are many women working in the journal, journalism industry in Wales and in the political unit of the BBC Wales there's a, a woman leads that department, Bethan Powers, who will be joining us later. But my feeling is that the journalistic values of in the political sphere tend to be male-driven, they tend to be macho and the good stories tend to be seen as those about conflict, those about arguing, male-type issues. So there are no stories, stories about people cooperating and solving problems and doing things for the benefit of the community. Those are not stories that seem to reach the news, but they're the type of things that women tend to do. So I don't know, Karen, whether you'd like to make a comment about that and the journalistic values in, in the political area. Thanks, thanks for that comment. I mean, a absolutely. And I mean, I'm doing some work at the moment which is looking at women and men in decision-making in European media industries across the kind of 27 member states. And what women themselves say is precisely they talk about a macho kind of news culture and that in order to survive, they have to become as macho as their, as their male colleagues to, to avoid their copy being spiked, to avoid them being seen as, as kind of feminists. And what they say is that they can't, they can't both be journalists and, and women. Uh, rather, they, can, they can't be journalists, or they, or they can be journalists or they can be women. They can't be women journalists because somehow that, that is not, uh, it's not possible. So, so what they say is, what happens is that they have to kind of outperform their, their male colleagues. And what women politicians say, interestingly, is that they have often had more, not necessarily spiteful, but sometimes more spiteful uh, press from kind of women journalists who've been to interview them because they've disclosed things on a kind of sisterly basis, which in retrospect, when it then comes out in print, they can't say they've been misquoted, but they would then, then say, I would never have revealed quite so much of myself, but I've, I thought that we were friends. So there's a kind of idea about that journalistic culture and the political culture. And women, poli women journalists working within a kind of political field either, either become one of the boys or they leave. I mean, that, it's very difficult for them to actually survive with, with, with integrity. Um, and that's what they would say. And I think that if we look at, at kind of political journalists in, in some, not, not all of them, but certain political journalists, women, you would sort of see a, a particular kind of tone in someone like Amanda Patel or um, Anne Leslie, both working in the in Daily Mail. And, and it's just very unfortunate because it doesn't, it, you know, we, we, cause it, it's suggesting that that is the only way to be, and, and that isn't the only way to be. 
I'd like to pick up on the first point you made as well on um, the kind of visibility of older women in the Welsh media. I know that Network BBC had to respond because of the Country Vale presenter's case. I don't think well, the Welsh media has responded. I can't think, with the exception of Betsan, who's a very youthful mid 40s lady, I can't think of hardly anybody on SOC or um, HDV or BBC Wales, uh, women in that kind of 50 plus or late 40s age group, you know, regularly on television. So uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a sadness. Um, I know Sean wanted to, to add one more point to your question originally. So The first point is to answer Ellen's comment. There are many people who have complained about the lack of women over 50 before the camera. Julie Walters has written in great length about this, and Equity Union over 20 years ago has been talking about this, but unfortunately things aren't changing. But what comes from the press is, well, people don't want to see older women on television. But thinking about films like Calendar Girls, Mamma Mia, women can't be funny, can't they? Yes, they can. And Back to, I, I'm sorry, did I, you took me a bit surprised. I didn't answer your question very well. I think um, I mentioned earlier about influences in terms of the media, and your question was about paying high salaries to particular talent. Because of the recession and because of concerns with broadcasters in particular to have very high viewing figures, and I'm sure, Caroline, you'll be able to... Um, um, a teggy, I'm speaking two languages now, to, to emphasise this as well, is that sometimes programme makers will insist on you using particular talent because they want the viewers, and that then pushes the price of that talent up. So that is a huge issue. So if they want, I don't know, Jonathan Ross or someone like that, then obviously their status is going to go up and their costs are going to go up because the broadcasters are saying, oh, we're not taking any risks, we're not taking any risks. So that, that means that the value for them is getting higher and higher. There are thousands of, of good people out there that can be good presenters, and I'm sure people would be glad to see them, but I think it's a self-perpetuating myth and it's a huge problem. Um, I think the media industry relies heavily on volunteers, and women in particular often volunteer a lot of their time for charities and to help their community. So I think potentially a, a good way forward would be to introduce a flat fee for you know women to appear in the media or appear on radio or appear in TV, so that even if it was a small amount, you know, sixty pounds or you know something around that that would basically just pay for their out-of-pocket expenses, I think, would enable w more women to appear in the media and on radio and you know in TV, which I think would be a good step forward. I mean, sorry, I, flat fees, I'm, I mean, I might be contradicting what I said earlier, but minimum fees minimum, for things, I think, yeah. are fine, and working for nothing is not acceptable. Rosemary, I know we've probably run slightly over our allotted time. Are we allowed to squeeze one more question out? Or one more, of course, yeah. One more lady in the middle there. Linda Williams, Newport Women's Aid. We held recently a, a domestic abuse awareness raising day and unfortunately we couldn't get our local paper or BBC Wales to cover the event because we weren't prepared to centralise the victim. Um, have you any ideas how we can get around this for the future? Freelance journalism. Get some women journalists. Use your local university. Anyone who's doing production very interested in, in doing that as, as projects, get, get, get them while they're young. Um, also, I think we had, did a programme, I uh, worked on a programme, oh, it's a long time ago now, I was going back 20 years, and uh, it was a series actually about women in prison and there was women and domestic abuse. And uh, it was about um, gaining tr get, get, getting to know a producer that you can trust and, and doing, doing some art items with, with them. Not sensationalising, but doing it in, you know, finding out you know, building relationships and finding someone you can trust. The other thing is, like, um, John, um, what's his name, John Humphreys on the Today programme yesterday, was it yesterday morning, did an item with, um, with uh, someone who'd been, been abused, but they didn't want to talk about it, so they had an actor in to, to do the, um, you know, to, to play the part sort of thing. So there are ways around it, but, um, but again, it's about building those sort of relationships. Thank you, Sean. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the session. Uh, we probably haven't touched on as many things we'd like to. I'm sure we could have gone on for the rest of the afternoon. I'd just like to leave you with, um, 
We've talked about solutions, um, and I just want to kind of outline the problem very briefly. Um, in a typical month, 78% of newspaper articles are written by men, 72% of question time contributors are men, 84% of reporters and guests on Radio 4's Today Show are men, where are all the women? This was written by a Guardian journalist, and it's now sparked a whole project by women in journalism scrutinising the gender balance of the British press. I also started with Welsh and Male's 50 Sexiest Women. We had uh, 100 Welsh heroes a few years ago, and only Catherine Zeta-Jones made the top 20. Uh, if we took that poll again, I hope that will never happen. Thank you very much for coming today, and thank you to our speakers. The National Assembly for Wales is the democratically elected body that represents the interests of Wales and its people, makes laws for Wales, and holds the Welsh Government to account. For more information and to find out who represents you, go to assemblywales.org or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.